Let's start with a simple definition. Uh, anesthesia devices are used in operating rooms in hospitals by the medical staff to ensure that operative and diagnostic procedures can be performed on a patient without pain in unconscious and relaxed state. This is usually done by administering inhalation anesthetics, مواد مخدرة بالاستنشاق. Uh, and the surgery in this uh, case will be without perception rather than without sensation. People uh, realize that the, the sensation is still there, but actually we don't really perceive it. And basically we, we come out of anesthesia with amnesia, so we don't really uh, even remember that we had that much pain with, during the surgery. So basically uh, the surgery is performed without perception of the patient to the pain that, that occurs during the uh, procedure. Before general surgery, of course, it was a very difficult uh, matter to uh, uh, perform a procedure on a person because it was very painful. And basically, several people had to constrain that person so that the procedure is done. And this is really uh, was very difficult both for the patient and for the surgeon. Right now, we use the inhalation anesthetic that are uh, basically administered to the patient through uh, 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 a device, a simple breathing device. And basically, the patient goes to, uh, uh, to sleep and basically wakes up when the surgery is over. So this makes the, the, the surgery much simpler for the surgeon because the patient is not moving. And basically, the patient does not feel the pain during the surgery. Inhalation anesthetics work by producing loss of awareness and neuromuscular blockade. Uh, basically, this uh, is done while the vital physiological functions uh, such as breathing and uh, heart beating, the uh, maintaining of uh, blood pressure, things of that sort, continue to function without any interruption. Uh, the inhalation anesthetics cause reduction in nerve transmission at synapses, and basically this causes the uh, sensations to be uh, blocked and basically uh, uh, do not, uh, uh, such signals do not uh, reach uh, the brain to cause uh, perception of pain. Uh, exactly how inhalation aesthetics inhibit synaptic uh, neurotransmission is not really uh, fully understood until now, but basically we have enough experiments and enough evidence that they work. Uh, there are several types of uh, inhalation anesthetics, and basically they started from the 1840s, and uh, uh, the, the first inhalation anesthetic that was used was nitrous oxide, N2O, and uh, this was uh, called the laughing gas. And this has been used since then until now to uh, induce uh, uh, sedation or uh, loss of pain or uh, uh, reduction of pain in uh, surgeries and in uh, uh, dental offices and things of that sort. And basically, it's, uh, it's a very uh, harmful gas and uh, basically can, can be used uh, without any uh, major uh, uh, side effect. Then ether was invented and basically then chloroform. Chloroform is also... Uh, uh, very useful, but unfortunately, it was found to be hepato, uh, uh, hepato, uh, 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 toxic, meaning that it, uh, it causes poisoning of the liver, and basically, uh, it's not uh, uh, used any longer. Uh, several generations of inhalation anesthetics have been uh, developed over the years, and basically, uh, uh, for ether, for example, the problem with ether is that it was flammable, and uh, several of these actually were flammable, and uh, touch of flammability can cause problems in, during the uh, operations. Uh, and basically, uh, it was a desire to have uh, inhalation anesthetics that are inflammable. So basically, uh, if we look at all these uh, uh, types of uh, uh, inhalation anesthetics, we can differentiate between them uh, on the basis of the onset and duration of action, meaning that when they will uh, start to uh, basically uh, uh, induce the uh, loss of awareness and things of that sort, and for how long. And also, it's very important to understand the mechanism of clearance, meaning that how these anesthetics will be uh, cleared out of the human body after the operation, because we don't want to have uh, an inhalation anesthetic that will remain in the human body. The safety, meaning that it's not toxic like uh, chloroform, for example, we said that it's hepatotoxic. So basically, we want to make sure that uh, the safety is there. So basically, these, uh, these types, these different types are compared in terms of the safety of their operation. And also, as we said, the flammability is a, a very important matter, especially when we use uh, electrosurgical units right now where, where uh, uh, electrical arcs are uh, are utilized to uh, cause uh, coagulation of it, things of that sort. And if you have a flammable anesthetics in the operating room, this can cause uh, a, a, an explosion or something of that sort. So basically, flammability is a very important criteria to uh, 
to be taken into account when choosing inhalation anesthetics. The function diagram of the anesthesia machine uh, starts with the input gas supplies, which can come from cylinders or from the central gas supply from the hospital. These go through uh, gas inlets, and basically they have to contain uh, both oxygen and the nitrous oxide. Uh, they have to go to, uh, through a pressure reduction stage to uh, uh, make sure that the very high pressures coming from the cylinder or from, from the central gas supply is, re is reduced to a safe level for, uh, for, for the machine and for the patient. Later on, it goes through a flow meter and vaporizer. Basically, flow meter looks like this and controls the mixing of uh, oxygen and nitrous oxide. And the, the vaporizer is basically the device that is responsible for adding the inhalation anesthetics. Uh, after that, the, 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 the mixture goes through a common gas outlet, and the common gas outlet uh, leads the uh, uh, mixture through the breathing circuit of a ventilator. And the, basically, it's a, just a regular ventilator, but it has a, a one, one minor difference. It's that it allows uh, rebreathing of the uh, expired air after uh, removing the carbon dioxide. And basically, uh, uh, this uh, uh, controls the uh, amount of uh, uh, air and the pressure going to the patient. In addition to that, we have uh, uh, several monitoring apparatus in, in, uh, in, uh, in the system that uh, control or uh, monitor the safety of the di different parts of the device and the patient. Here is a simplified diagram of uh, uh, anesthesia gas mixing. Uh, here at the input of the anesthesia machine, you will find that uh, uh, oxygen and nitrous oxide come either from reserve cylinders or from pipe gas. Uh, uh, they have very different pressures if they come from the cylinder of the gases. For example, for, uh, for the cylinders, the oxygen come at very high pressure of 13,700 kilopascal. The nitrous oxide come at 4,400 kilopascal. The pipeline comes uh, at a pressure of about 400 kilopascal. Uh, this is about four bar. So basically, uh, uh, here in the, in the inlet uh, circuit, we actually have a pressure reduction so that the pressure of the oxygen nitrous oxide at the output of this stage is uh, safe uh, for the patient for further uh, uh, breathing circuit. Uh, once we do that, we have here a part where uh, uh, we have uh, needle valves and flow meters, and these are responsible for mixing the nitrous oxide and the oxygen to the, uh, the required uh, uh, mixing ratio. After that, uh, uh, the uh, mixture uh, uh, is uh, actually uh, passed through a vaporizer, and the vaporizer has the inhalation anesthetics, and the inhalation anesthetics is added to this mixture so that the, 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 the mixture that comes out of the common gas outlet here has all the ingredients for uh, the uh, anesthesia required by the patient. And basically, uh, there is a, a bypass here uh, called oxygen flush, the oxygen flush uh, works to purge any contents of the breathing circuit, just to make sure that the contents of the breathing circuit are 100% oxygen before we start the uh, uh, anesthesia operation. And basically, uh, uh, this is done only when the patient is not connected because it can uh, cause harm uh, to the lungs when we, when we add uh, a pressure at very high, uh, 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 very high pressure to the, the, the lungs. So basically, this is done only before the breathing circuit or the mass, the patient mass is connected to the patient. So basically we're talking about uh, uh, at this point here, we have uh, the gas that has both the, uh, the uh, nitrous oxide, it has the inhalation anesthetics, it has oxygen with a concentration of more than 25% to be uh, a safe, uh, safe for the patient uh, inhalation. So the main components of the anesthesia machine uh, are the, basically the drug dosing. The drug dosing part uh, uh, is responsible for mixing oxygen and nitrous oxide. And this is done by flow control valves and flow meters. And basically the administration of inhalation anesthetics and this is taken care of by the vaporizers. We have also the second component is the ventilator with breathing system. This is basically, as we said, uh, the same as the intensive care unit ventilators, but the only difference is that it allows rebreathing of the uh, expired air. The third component is monitoring. And monitoring, you have to monitor three uh, different things. We have to monitor the device itself, uh, device monitoring, which uh, uh, 
monitors the drug dosing and ventilator and basically makes sure that the uh, uh, mixing of the uh, inhalation aesthetics is uh, accurate as the doctor uh, prescribed and basically uh, for the ventilator we have to make sure that the uh, amount of air and the pressure and things of that sort are exactly the same as uh, what the patient needs. The second component is the patient monitoring and this is basically a regular uh, intensive care unit monitoring which ba basically monitors patients vital signs. The last thing is the anesthesia effect monitoring which is a very unique uh, uh, monitoring uh, part uh, which actually measures the, the depth of anesthesia. This is extremely important to make sure that the patient is safe and that the anesthesia provided is uh, is keeping the patient in a safe level and not uh, in, a, in a deeper anesthesia than uh, needed or uh, allows the patient to, uh, to basically uh, be recovered after uh, the, the surgery is over. Uh, the first part that uh, uh, takes care of mixing the oxygen and the nitrous oxide uh, is based on a very simple idea that the constriction uh, causes significant pressure drop. So basically, if you'd like to mix oxygen and nitrous oxide, we can use uh, what's called uh, a needle valve. And this needle valve is uh, operated by uh, changing the distance of this needle from the uh, opening right there. And basically, depending on where this needle is uh, placed, the amount of uh, flow here will be different. So basically, when you change that, for, uh, for example, for oxygen and for nitrous oxide, we can control the level of mixing between the two. In order to know exactly how, how, how the mixing ratio will be like, we actually add uh, something called a, a flow meter, which is basically a, a something called a bobbin. A bobbin basically is a float, like a float device that actually uh, is uh, 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 levitated by the, uh, by the flow from here. So basically the, the gas flow will have a force, uh, will exert a force on this uh, bobbin. And basically uh, the bobbin is, uh, uh, rises to the level that is, uh, uh, that is uh, basically um, in balance with the kind of uh, forces that are received from the gas flow. And basically we can uh, have a, a, a different markings here on this, uh, uh, on this uh, tube, taper tube, so that we can know from the location of the bobbin, uh, the flow rate is, uh, is uh, the, the value of the flow rate is uh, how much. Basically we, we uh, adjust the, the, the the one responsible for the nitrous oxide and the one responsible for oxygen, we can actually adjust the mixing ratio between the two. The part responsible for adding the anesthetic agent is the vaporizers. Uh, basically, volatile anesthetic agents are used to achieve unconsciousness. As we uh, said before, we use inhalation anesthetics. And basically, such, uh, the, such agents are exhalable and evaporate quickly. So, uh, so such as isoflurane and sevoflurane. The anesthetic agent vaporizers uh, converts anesthetic agent from liquid to vapor and mixes uh, that with the fresh gas at preset concentrations. The, usually uh, this is done by an apparatus that looks like this. Basically we have the anesthetic agents right here. And basically uh, on top of it, you'll find because it's, uh, it's, uh, it can evaporate very quickly, you'll find that the uh, uh, concentration of the uh, anesthetic agent vapor on top of it will be almost 30%. So if we have fresh gas input and basically pass a part of that in, uh, into this uh, vaporizing chamber and another part uh, in a bypass flow, and basically uh, we control the ratio between these two, we can actually get the concentration that we need on the other side. So basically vaporizers uh, uh, are primarily designed to reduce the high saturation uh, concentration of 30% uh, almost 30% to concentration required during the anesthesia which is about 2%. Vaporizers can be implemented either mechanically or electronically. Uh, the first one which is the mechanical vaporizer uh, relies on a mechanical device that does not require any power and basically uh, it takes the input fresh gas and uh, uh, divides it between a bypass, uh, a bypass path and a path that goes over the, uh, the inhalation aesthetic, as we said before. So basically the part that goes right here, basically uh, gets a high concentration of uh, inhalation aesthetic uh, uh, vapor and basically goes back and gets mixed with the part that goes through the, uh, the uh, bypass uh, path, okay? And the, 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 the uh, uh, summation of the two will give us the concentration that we need. 
we can control through a, a, a very simple bulb here. It's a, it looks like a, a, another needle bulb where we can control from a dial over there. And basically this controls uh, the mixture uh, between the bypass and the one that goes through the uh, inhalation anesthetics. Uh, moreover, we have here a flap, bimetallic strip, and this bimetallic strip actually changes shape uh, based on the temperature. So basically uh, takes care of uh, compensation of the temperature, because as we know, if this is uh, placed in a temperature, high temperature, the concentration of the paper here will be higher. And if it's in a cooler temperature, the concentration here will be lower. So basically here in cooler temperatures, it allows the flow to be a little bit more. Uh, and basically in warmer temperatures, it allows the flow to be a little bit less. So whatever the temperature will be, the flow that is going uh, through the uh, uh, part where the inhalation anesthetics are placed uh, will have exactly the same concentration when it goes and mixes with the uh, bypass uh, part. Alternatively, electronic vaporizers uh, do everything that the mechanical vaporizer does in electronic form. So basically we have also here the bypass uh, direction and basically here, this is the part that goes through the inhalation anesthetic, but here we control the flow of the uh, uh, part that goes through the inhalation anesthetics by a valve, through a valve right here. And basically we measure the temperature, we measure the pressure, we measure everything so that we can accurately make the, the uh, 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 mixing so that the concentration output will be exactly as we desire. So this is basically uh, an electronic form that allows exactly the, the same function that the mechanical vaporizer does. But this one ha actually has to uh, consume some power. So basically it has uh, to have an electrical power. And also it has a compensation, much more accurate compensation of temperature and pressure variations inside the vaporizer. So these are a little bit more accurate than the mechanical vaporizers. One of the important functions of anesthesia machine is uh, the emergency oxygen flush. Uh, this allows a flow of about 35 to 75 liter per minute uh, uh, of oxygen at a pressure of about 400 kilopascal uh, to purge the contents of any uh, uh, other gases that are present in the breathing circuit. So this ensures that the, uh, uh, the mask that is put to, uh, on the patient will actually be safe rather than uh, uh, allow the patient to breathe something that wasn't really intended for him to breathe. And this is activated by a non-locking button like this. This basically looks like this. And the actual uh, diagram of it looks like this. So basically, this is a self-closing uh, self valve. So basically, we are, when we are not uh, pressing this button, uh, this uh, self-closing valve actually will close this uh, opening and basically will allow no oxygen to flow. And basically, whenever we uh, push this button, the oxygen will have a, a path to flow uh, from outside here to the uh, breathing circuit. It is very important to note that uh, uh, the emergency oxygen flush should never be used when the patient is uh, uh, on the system, as the patient is, uh, has the breathing circuit uh, connected to him, because it can actually uh, cause uh, uh, parametric harm, uh, par parametric uh, damage to the uh, uh, lungs, because the pressure is much higher than what, whatever we can uh, uh, tolerate in the, in the human lungs. A very important part of the anesthesia machine, which is unique to anesthesia machines only, is the scavenging system. Uh, this, the main uh, motivation for having a scavenging system is that the chronic exposure to low concentrations of inhaled anesthetics may pose a health hazard to operating room personnel. So we cannot really uh, 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 let the uh, mixture of uh, gases delivered to the patient uh, be uh, present in the operating room. So scavenging is the collection and subsequent removal of vented gases from the operating room. And uh, it, has, it can be actually implemented using two different systems. One of them is the active uh, system, which uh, involves connecting the, uh, the, the, the scavenger uh, of the uh, anesthesia machine to a vacuum, to the uh, 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 hospital vacuum system. And basically the gases are sucked in by the vacuum to the uh, outside of the, uh, of the operating room. The passive system, on the other hand, uh, is connected to the ventilation duct and basically wet gases flow out of the machine on their own and basically uh, get dissipated uh, through the ventilation duct. Uh, uh, it's very important to uh, mention that the adequate uh, operating room ventilation is very important and is still necessary even though the, the scavenging system may be there. And basically air should be exchanged at least 15 times per hour by the operating room ventilation system in order for the operating room to remain safe for the operating personnel. 
A critical part of the design of the anesthesia machine is the anti-hypoxic safety features. These are designed to prevent the delivery of gas mixtures with oxygen less than 25%. Uh, this involves either oxygen uh, analyzers, which uh, uh, allow for uh, continuous measurement of oxygen concentration, and basically whenever the oxygen concentration in the gas mixture goes below 25%, the, uh, the system is shut off. Basically, the, 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 the patient is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, ventilated using uh, regular air. And basically, uh, the other one is the mechanical uh, means that allows linking the oxygen and the nitrous oxide flow control valves uh, using oxygen failure protection device. The oxygen failure protection device looks like this. It has a, a valve that is operated using the pressure from the oxygen itself. So basically, the oxygen coming out, coming in from the uh, from the cylinders or from the uh, uh, from the central gas supply uh, uh, is actually connected to this part here. So if the pressure is high enough, this will compress this uh, 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 lever right there and basically allows room for the nitrous oxide to flow through here. Whenever the oxygen concentration goes below uh, 200 kilopascal or 250 kilopascal, which is uh, very critical, uh, this here, this spring here will actually force this uh, 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 this uh, piston here to go down and basically this closes the path for nitrous oxide so basically if the oxygen is not enough if the oxygen pressure is low the nitrous oxide is basically uh, stopped so basically uh, uh, we, we, in this case we we will never have a case where the nitrous oxide uh, pressure is higher than the oxygen uh, pressure and basically whenever this happens uh, the patient is ventilated using regular air, and basically this is safer than having uh, a, a hypoxic uh, mixture uh, going through the breathing circuit. In order to ensure that the patient is safe during anesthesia, we have to have monitoring uh, in anesthesia, and basically we have to monitor nine variables uh, continuously. These nine variables consist of five uh, uh, for device monitoring and four for patient monitoring. If you look at the device monitoring, we have to monitor all the parameters that can cause uh, uh, any harm to the patient, like oxygen concentration, uh, carbon dioxide concentration, anesthetic agent concentration, uh, pressure, and flow rate. And basically, from the flow rate, we can integrate to get the volume of the breathing uh, air. Okay. And basically, uh, uh, for the patient monitoring, we have to monitor mainly for signals, uh, uh, electrocardiogram, a non-invasive blood pressure, oxygen saturation, and the body temperature. And basically uh, uh, for uh, regular uh, or for advanced modern uh, anesthesia machines like this, usually you will have a screen that has the patient monitoring and another for the uh, device monitoring. Sometimes you can get both on the same screen like this, but uh, uh, it's very important for the anesthesiologist to monitor all these parameters so that he uh, can notice uh, uh, any changes that uh, happen during the surgery and basically uh, make sure that the uh, uh, that the patient is safe. The way we measure all gases involved with anesthesia machine, including uh, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and anesthetic uh, agents, uh, we use something called infrared absorption spectroscopy. Basically, infrared absorption spectroscopy uh, relies on the fact that polyatomic gases uh, absorb infrared radiation at characteristic frequencies. For example, if you look at uh, CO2 or carbon dioxide versus uh, nitrous oxide, we find that each of them has a different uh, 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 bandwidth or a different wavelength where uh, their absorption is, uh, is, uh, is present. So basically, if we use a filter, um, basically we can extract this part here to know the, or to measure the nitrous oxide, and basically use another filter to uh, measure this part here to uh, measure the carbon dioxide uh, in, the, in the breathing gas. Uh, also for the anesthetic agents, we have each of them having a different uh, shape and a different uh, uh, bandwidth or, uh, uh, with respect to one another. So basically here, because they have overlap, we measure in uh, five different locations. And basically, based on these five different locations, we can actually uh, uh, solve uh, a few equations and get the uh, concentrations of each one of these. If we have a mixture, if we have only one of them, then we don't have any problem. We just measure that particular uh, 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 measurement that, is, that corresponds to uh, the, the gas in question. The uh, infrared absorption spectroscopy consists of an infrared uh, uh, light lamp 
and basically we enter the, the, the gas sample through a transparent quartz uh, uh, cuvette and basically we have a scanning filter that chooses which one of the uh, of the uh, which one of the bandwidth that we are going to use in measurement and basically we have uh, focusing lenses and a detector and basically uh, we can actually sometimes use a multi-channel analyzer to compute all of them at the same time and then once we get that we can actually use beer lambert law to uh, uh, compute the concentration of each one of them so basically this technique is uh, used for all gases except for oxygen oxygen has a very different way of, of measurement for oxygen measurement, we have three techniques that allow us to do that. The first one is the polarographic technique, which has a construction that looks like this, where we have a platinum electrode, and we have an electrolyte, and we have a silver electrode. And basically, we have a Teflon membrane right there, and this is a site where we sense the oxygen. Uh, basically, the idea is that when the oxygen molecules come through this Teflon membrane through diffusion, by diffusion, uh, they will react with this electrolyte and basically cause a, a current to flow between the uh, silver and the platinum electrode. And this current can be measured and basically it, it can be uh, used to get the concentration of the oxygen. Galvanic cell or fuel cell uh, 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 sensor has a very similar idea to the polarographic uh, uh, method, polarographic technique, where you have a, a sensing membrane as well and you have an electrolyte and you have an anode and basically the same thing also happens here where you have a current uh, that flows between the uh, cathode and the anode based on the concentration of oxygen flowing through this membrane. Uh, the problem of these two techniques is that uh, uh, both rely on diffusion of oxygen through the membrane and uh, through the, the electrolytes. And basically this causes uh, both of them to have a very slow response time between 20 and 30 seconds. So in order to measure uh, an, oxygen, uh, an oxygen reading, uh, we have to wait for almost half a minute to get one, okay? And this is this is not a very good uh, uh, response time for uh, uh, for safe measurement of oxygen. The third technique is the paramag paramagnetic technique, which relies on the fact that the oxygen has a paramagnetic uh, uh, characteristics. Paramagnetic characteristics means that it's affected by a magnetic field. So whenever we apply a magnetic field, the oxygen uh, 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 follows the magnetic field. Basically, in, in the regular, uh, without magnetic field, uh, in, the, in the steady state, uh, oxygen can be arranged in any random orientation. And basically, whenever we turn on the magnet, the oxygen will have to follow the magnet, we have to align with the magnet. So basically, uh, it will cause motion in the inside of the uh, part where the oxygen is uh, present. And so we can actually use that because the uh, the, the, uh, the, the motion of the oxygen with the magnetic field will cause a higher pressure in the side where the oxygen is, uh, oxygen is present. And so we can actually measure that uh, uh, with respect to another reference. We measure the difference between the pressure in these two compartments with, uh, with the use of switch magnetic field. And basically we can get a, 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 a reading with a very fast response time uh, for the oxygen concentration. So basically, it, it can measure uh, inspired and expired oxygen concentration on a breath-by-breath -breath basis. So basically, you can get an updated value for oxygen each breath, which is really very good. So basically, this is why this is uh, the most widely used uh, uh, oxygen sensor in the market today. To measure the flow rate, we have a very popular uh, flow rate sensor called the pneumotagograph. Uh, the principle is that uh, sensing change in pressure across fixed resistance through which the gas flow is laminar uh, is, can be used to calculate the flow rate. Basically, this is analogous to measuring current through resistance in electric circuits. For example, here, if you would like to measure the current, we basically, uh, 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 we know the resistance, and we, if we know the voltage drop, we can actually compute the current as the voltage drop over the resistance. This is Ohm's law in electric circuits. This is exact, exactly equivalent to having a pipe like this where with a pressure drop of P1 minus P2 and the known uh, uh, flow resistance uh, of R. And basically, when we know R, when we construct a, a sensor with a, a known uh, laminar resistance, we can actually compute the flow as the difference between the two pressures. We have two pressure sensors, right? One here and one there across uh, the laminar resistor. And basically, the difference between these two pressures over the laminar resistor will give us the flow. So basically, the tidal volume then can be computed by the integration of the flow rate over time. So the flow rate is like the current, and basically the volume is equivalent to the charge. 
So uh, whenever we would like to compute the charge, we just integrate the current. Here we do that the same thing uh, for the flow. We, we integrate the flow to compute the tidal volume. Tidal volume is the volume uh, inspired or expired each breath. Uh, one advantage of this particular sensor is that it has bi-directional operation. So basically we can uh, detect uh, uh, flow going this way and, or going that way. So basically we can uh, use it to measure uh, both inspiration and expiration tidal volume, which is unique to this particular sensor. Another idea to compute the flow rate using some called, something called spirometer. The spirometer is used to measure exhale tidal volume in breathing circuit, typically near the exhalation volume. Uh, uh, basically, uh, a very specific type, there, is, there are several types of uh, this particular uh, uh, sensor. Uh, one of them is the vein anemometer. It looks like this, it has a, a piece that connects to the uh, uh, expired uh, uh, gas uh, direction uh, that looks like this. It has veins like this. And basically, it resembles the device that is used to compute the, the air wind uh, speed. Okay, so whenever the uh, uh, breathing air goes through this, uh, these veins, basically they cause this to rotate. And basically whenever this rotates, this piece here rotates. We put a clip that looks like this uh, outside of this device, outside of this uh, piece. And basically we have uh, optical uh, path, optical directions that uh, go through the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, this piece right there. So whenever this is right there, we, we have the path between this LED and this uh, light detector cutoff while this is on, okay? This path here is on. So basically we'll keep getting pulses on and off between uh, these two sensors right there. And basically based on them, we can actually compute the number of rotations per minute for this uh, vein. And based on that, we can actually uh, calibrate this device to compute the uh, uh, airflow based on the number of uh, rotations per minute. A unique type of monitoring that is uh, used in association with anesthesia machines is uh, the depth of anesthesia monitoring. Uh, this assesses the uh, depth of anesthesia of the patient uh, and makes sure that the patient is uh, in a state of general anesthesia and makes sure that uh, the, the operation can proceed without uh, 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 having a problem with the patient still awake. So this can be assessed using a nervous stimulator uh, as a, a very small device uh, that uh, assesses the neuromuscular blockade that makes sure that the link between the uh, nerves and the muscles is uh, uh, blocked uh, uh, as is uh, in the function of the inhalation anesthetics. And uh, to assess that, we use a supramaximal stimulus administered to a motor nerve. So basically we uh, attach electrodes like this and basically uh, uh, put a, a, a very large stimulus to make sure that the uh, motor nerve going through this part right there is uh, uh, all, all of these fibers are uh, completely excited. And basically we assess the uh, motor response evoked uh, by, uh, by this particular excitation using either accelerometry or uh, uh, kinemiography. Basically one of them actually assesses the motion of the, uh, uh, of the muscles associated with this particular nerve or it can actually use the, uh, the, the volume uh, change of the muscles uh, using something that, like a piece electric transducer or something like this. In both cases, uh, whenever we get a, a response to a, a, a nerve stimulation, then we know that uh, the patient is still uh, 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 not exactly under general anesthesia. So basically we have to make sure that the, the response from uh, this nerve excitation is below a certain level to make sure that the patient is safe to operate on. More advanced depths of anesthesia monitoring rely on EEG. So uh, one of them actually, uh, uh, which is a burst suppression ratio, uh, uh, is computed from the EEG, which is a fraction of time in an epoch in which the EEG is suppressed and is usually averaged over uh, uh, one minute. So basically, if you look at these, uh, uh, these excitations right there, so basically we look at the parts where we have an EEG signal versus the, the areas that are uh, uh, basically without any uh, uh, ECG, EEG. Basically, these are suppressed and these are uh, exactly uh, the same as usual. So basically, uh, the smaller the fraction of the uh, parts of EEG uh, uh, where it is suppressed, uh, or the higher the fraction where EEG is suppressed, the higher uh, the depth of anesthesia. 
Uh, another much more accurate uh, measure is the bispectral index, which is currently uh, probably the leading uh, uh, technique used for depth of anesthesia monitoring. And basically, it's an EEG-driven variable from both uh, time and frequency features, including the uh, birth suppression ratio, the BSR. Okay, so basically, BSR here is a part of the uh, calculation of the bispectral index. The bispectral index takes values from 0 to 100, where 100 or 90 is uh, uh, designated for awake or memory intact, and basically below 90, below 85 to uh, probably 65 is uh, sedation, where the patient is uh, lightheaded and basically, uh, um, uh, basically the sensation of pain is not as uh, as much. Uh, below 65, between 65 and 45, basically we're talking about general anesthesia. This is the range of general anesthesia. This is the range where the patient should be in general anesthesia. Uh, whenever you go below that, this is, uh, can be a little bit more dangerous. So basically, if you go, for example, to a pi spectral index of 10, you almost get uh, your EEG completely suppressed, which is very dangerous. When you go loud, uh, that uh, deep in, uh, in anesthesia, it uh, uh, it is not uh, uh, guaranteed to, to be able to go back and uh, become a 100. So basically, we have to make sure that the range of uh, uh, general anesthesia is, uh, uh, is basically maintained. And basically, whenever we go a little bit down, we have to make sure that uh, we go back up to make sure that the patient is safe. So basically, uh, we have devices that do that. We have uh, uh, electrodes that measure the EEG. And basically, you have an interface that looks like this and basically computes the uh, by spectral index and the doctor has to measure that, has to has to monitor that and make sure that it's within the range that is safe for the general anesthesia and safe for the patient at the same time. This is very important because uh, otherwise, if you are uh, a little bit up, a little bit higher, then the patient may uh, uh, become awake during the, the, the operation. If you go a little bit down, then you're risking losing the patient. So this is one of the very important measures that uh, should be uh, adapted and should be uh, used during the anesthesia uh, operation. Finally, let's look uh, at uh, uh, an example of a modern anesthesia machine. This is the uh, front uh, uh, part of the uh, anesthesia machine. This, uh, this is how it looks like in reality. And basically, uh, if you look at these different parts, we have the flow meters right there. These are the flow meters where, uh, where the mixing of uh, oxygen and uh, nitrous oxide is, uh, is done. And basically, where we measure the, uh, the flow rates of both uh, oxygen and nitrous oxide. We have uh, the uh, vaporizers are right there. You have the uh, display for monitoring the different uh, um, parameters of uh, the device right there. Uh, we have the breathing circuit that comes out of this part here. This is a ventilator part where actually uh, the, uh, uh, the patient is connected uh, through the breathing circuit to this part right there. And basically, uh, uh, the, the doctor will uh, simply just adjust the flow meters, adjust the vaporizers, and basically uh, make sure that the uh, breathing gas is uh, in order by looking at this display right there, just to make sure that, uh, uh, that the parameters of the device is as uh, programmed. If you look at the back side of the same machine, you will find that uh, uh, the connections of gas uh, cylinders is there. So basically, you put the gas cylinders uh, 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 right there and connect them to the gas inlets. And basically, we have the electricity uh, in and out, the basic electricity coming in. And basically, you have several outlets if you want to connect to other devices. And this is very much it. And basically, you, you might have also the scavenging connector where you can connect uh, to the uh, either the vacuum or the uh, ventilation duct of the operating room to make sure that the uh, uh, air, uh, air uh, uh, coming out of the uh, uh, anesthesia machine is uh, not vented through the uh, operating room uh, uh, atmosphere. It's actually uh, 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 coming out through the scavenging connector to the either the vacuum uh, uh, or the uh, ventilation duct to be taken outside of the operating room. Uh, 